Hey guys, new series, A Blast from the Past. That's right, ever since I got the 100,000 mark uh, award from uh, YouTube, I've been thinking about, over the last three years, all the videos that we did that nobody ever watched. We have 100,000 subscribers, and we have some videos that have less than 5,000 views. So, I decided to go back and pick out some of my favorite videos that nobody ever watched. Okay, the first uh, video that I want to highlight is a Walder PP that was issued to the propaganda ministry, led by Joseph Goebbels. We then also talk about the propaganda ministry, and that's one of my favorite parts. In there, if you watch to the end, you'll find out who said, I would rather be dead than live in a world without Hitler. Watch the video and you'll find out. Also, a caution about propaganda ministry. We think we're so far above that, but the same thing still happens today. So you have to watch out for the news stories that you listen to and what you read on the internet. I hope you enjoy the video. Today, I have one of the rarest PP variations. It's considered a factory variation, but when I um, look at the actual inscription, I, I can't say 100% for sure this wasn't done in an arsenal, but it is considered a factory variation, RRZ, which uh, in German, you can take a look at what it means. What that means is uh, the German radio broadcasting. It was run through the Ministry of Propaganda. It was considered a government position because it was owned by the government. All the, all the TV, news, uh, news media, and even movies was controlled by the Nazis. Um, so why would they have armed guards? Probably, you know, in discussing that with other people, it was probably more symbolic. So if you have a government office, you might have armed guards out front so that people would take it very seriously. But uh, certainly if uh, they're attacked in some way or a mob, comes after the radio station, they're not going to hold off many people with a Walder PP. Uh, Walder PP. Now, there were, uh, this is rare because uh, they fall into a specific serial range, and there's only six known. This is one of six known guns. If we take a look at survival rates, that tells me probably they only made 50 to 100. They wouldn't have that many guards, maybe uh, a couple in the lobby, a couple outside the door. So they didn't need a lot of these. So it had RRZ and then an inventory number, which you also see on RFEs and other guns. You'll see um, the initials and then the inventory number. Again, it's considered a factory variation of PP. Very rare. Uh, I've had this one for a few years, um, and I swore I would never sell it. But a fellow collector knew I had it, and he actually money whipped me. Okay. Now, if you don't know what that means, being money whipped is when somebody takes a wad of cash and slaps you in the face with it, and to the point you say, I give up, I give up, you can have it. So, uh, it's going out the door today. Uh, you know, I talk about walk-in Wednesday. This is a walk-out Wednesday because uh, I have to get it out the door today. So I said to Randy, let's hurry up and make a video of this gun. And you can see how beautiful it is. See the markings? Notice that it is Eagle N, probably made in around 1940. Um, and it has a nice high polish finish. It has the finger extension magazine, uh, which just, I think it just makes it look a little bit cooler. It doesn't, it doesn't extend the number of rounds, uh, but it does just give you a little bit of be better grip uh, in holding the pistol. So, only six known. This is one of six. Now, a little bit of background. Propaganda ministry. Uh, you know, we don't take that as seriously as it is. Uh, a trivia question uh, for those of you who might know your German history. Who is the uh, head of the propaganda ministry? That's right, Joseph Goebbels. You see a picture of him here. Uh, what's interesting to me is this Aryan race, this master race. A lot of these guys are kind of wimpy dudes. In fact, I'm not going to call him Goebbels anymore. He, he looks a little squirrely to me. So I'm going to call him Gerbils. So this is Joseph Gerbils. And a uh, little bit about his life. Uh, so he knew Hitler, uh, uh, they, I mean, they were ac actually good friends all the way back to the early 30s. Here's a picture of his wedding. His wife, uh, this is her second marriage, his first marriage. The boy next to him is his, his wife's son from his previous marriage, so that would be his stepson. That's Harold. You can see in the uh, picture that he's already in the Hitler youth. This is 1931. Hitler is not in power yet. But uh, they uh, obviously, the, you can see they're doing the Nazi salute. And look behind him. Who do you see that shadowy figure standing behind Gerbils? Uh, that is Adolf Hitler, who was his best man. They, they called him uh, the witness at the wedding, but he was the best man. So 
Uh, Goebbels and Hitler were, were bros going, going all the way back to the early 30s. And then when Hitler came to power, of course, he gives his friend, uh, all his friends got uh, cush jobs. Goebbels, <laughs> Gerbils, uh, was made the head of the propaganda ministry. Now, I already said this, that was a very important job. They actually pioneered the radio station uh, propaganda idea. Uh, it was uh, it used a lot in uh, Japan. If you've heard of Tokyo Rose, they would, they would broadcast to the troops, encouraging the soldiers to give up and go home. Uh, she uh, was a, a Japanese-American who, who did the broadcast. In the Axis uh, system, the radio station, they had Axis Sally. Axis Sally would broadcast propaganda. As one American to another, do you love the British? Well, of course the answer is no. Now, I'm told that the soldiers actually listened to this and they found it quite humorous because they'd always put a spin on the war that the Germans were winning everywhere when, <laughs> when of course, the Americans knew they weren't. First of all, they had posters uh, wanting to portray Hitler and the Nazis as these wonderful saviors, almost messiah-like people. And then any of their enemies, especially the Jews, they are always portrayed in very negative light. They actually made, uh, you, you're very familiar with all the posters that they made glorifying the Nazis, putting down their enemies. But they also made full-length movies, uh, big, huge productions. Uh, again, glorifying the German people and uh, making their enemies look foolish. Uh, so they get the people to get their head around the idea that we are the master race, we're better than everybody else. And before they invade a country, they just inundate you with propaganda. So for example, in 1939, before they uh, invaded Poland, there was not a firing uh, war until 1939. They just walked into countries and took over. A lot of propaganda to do that. They would say, well, this is really our land and here's why. But the first time they had a, a, a shooting war, a, a, a violent war, was when they invaded Poland. Now, for weeks and months before they invaded Poland, they actually broadcast over the radio that the German people in Poland were being bullied, women were being raped, uh, children were being abused. They portrayed the, the Polish people as terrible people um, and that these uh, poor, you know, innocent Germans were being, uh, were being persecuted. And it gets everybody all upset. And the night they invaded, they actually broadcast that a, uh, a Polish patrol of soldiers had crossed the border into Germany. And that was the final straw. We had to go in and stop the abuse of the Polish people. Of course, that was all a big lie. Uh, but that's part of the propaganda. And the, you wonder, how did the German people put up with this stuff? Well, they really believe that they're being persecuted and, and we're this strong nation and we shouldn't put up with this crap anymore. So they invaded Poland and as you know, they, they did a lot of horrific things to the people. But throughout the war, they continued to broadcast uh, this propaganda. Uh, now, what happened to Goebbels? Uh, we've already said, you know, he was in charge of this and uh, take a look at his family, beautiful children. And uh, what a shame. Uh, he was actually with Hitler at the end. Uh, he was in the bunker. Uh, Hitler killed himself a day before Goebbels killed himself. He actually killed his entire family. I've thought a lot about this in preparation for this video as I look at these, these kids. It's one thing to believe in ideology as an adult and say, you know what, and in fact his wife uh, actually wrote out a suicide note where she said, I can't imagine living in a world without Hitler. I don't want to live in a world without Hitler. So she chose to kill herself. She, they literally drank the Kool-Aid. They, they, they took poison. But before they did, they, they uh, poisoned all of their kids. There's a picture here, and Harold's actually in it. Harold is uh, the stepson. Uh, that was actually photoshopped. He was not in the bunker. He was uh, serving in the Luftwaffe, and he survived the war. He actually uh, was a West German businessman after the war. He survived the war. He was the only one who survived. But everybody else in the picture, the kids uh, 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 were poisoned, and then Mr. and Mrs. Goebbels killed themselves. Um, now imagine being the propaganda minister, where you know that everything you've been saying is a lie. Meaning he gets the reports from the Eastern Front or the Western Front and saying that we're in retreat everywhere, we're, we're, we're losing the war, all hope is lost. And he somehow spins that into the glorious German people are going to be victorious. He knows it's a lie, and he chooses to kill his children and then kill himself. 
That's drinking the Kool-Aid. I thought it would be good to end with the actual words from the suicide note that I found online from Magna Goebbels. People sometimes ask me, why do you do so many videos about the Nazis? I think it's good to repeat what I've said before, that our goal is, is to honor the American veterans who sacrificed their lives, the men and women who fought uh, this Nazi ideology and defeated it. If we don't study the past, we're liable to repeat it. My beloved son, by now we have been in the Fuhrer bunker for six days already. Daddy, your six little siblings, and I, for the sake of giving our national socialistic lives the only possible honorable end, you shall know that I stayed here against Daddy's will, and that even on last Sunday, the Fuhrer wanted me to get out. You know your mother, we have the same blood. For me, there was no wavering. Our glorious idea is ruined, and with it, everything beautiful and marvelous that I have ever known in my life. The world that comes after the Fuhrer and National Socialism is not any longer worth living, and therefore I took the children with me, for they are too good for the life that would follow, and a merciful God will understand me when I give them the salvation. The children are wonderful. There never is a word of complaint nor crying. The impacts are shaking the bunker. The elder kids cover the younger ones. Their presence is a blessing, and they are making the Fuhrer smile once in a while. May God help that I have the strength to perform the last and the hardest. We have only one goal left, loyalty to the Fuhrer, even in death. Harold, my dear son, I want to give you what I learned in life. Be loyal, loyal to yourself, loyal to the people, and loyal to your country. Be proud of us and try to keep us in dear memory.